So I'm going to start with taking a look at uh, Forex currencies. <clears throat> Where's Blake these days? He went off to manage a hedge fund. We all knew how good Blake was. We all figured that someday he might leave, and he finally did. Got the right offer. Got back into his true, true bailiwick, which was trading Rex with a large amount of money. <laughs> so I'm sure he's in seventh heaven. You can still catch him on Twitter. Tips are on Twitter. All right, notice you're seeing a little bit of movement here in the, in the uh, pound yen on a two-minute chart, so you'll want to pay attention to that. That's picking up about uh, oh, 25 pips in the last 15 minutes or so. So this chart basically derived from looking at Bollinger's. 20 period, two standard deviation Bollinger's, and looking for what we call squeezes. The only reason it's here is because we're looking for when the Bollinger's squeeze together. So for a lot of you who don't watch the follow-on portion of today's webinar after Morning Edge, in other words, with Kip and with myself, uh, many times we take a look at shorter-term intraday charts using a Bollinger to see whether there's whether we've kind of gone flat. So flat means the, that the distance between the upper and lower Bollinger is becoming narrow. And then once we get movement, in other words, momentum in a certain direction, the Bollingers will expand out. So when you start to see go from a narrow portion here, call a squeeze into a breakout, then we like to trade that for movement. Okay. So that's what you're seeing. And, and basically, out of these eight charts currently, the pound yen is the one that was moving the most. You can see how it kept pushing the Bollingers down, 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 down for about 15 minutes. So it finally made a move inside, but we're not expecting that move to be completely over just yet. It'll be follow-on movement. So do is then test that to see whether this move is over not. And, of course, the way we do that is by bringing in a completely different-looking chart, something like this, which we still have the Bollingers, but we then bring in two key moving averages, 8 exponential, which is the black, and then a 50 simple, which is the green. Okay. Now, if you want to have 50 exponential, that's fine. Once you get beyond 20, exponential and simple become so close together that they're virtually the same. Like I said, anything beyond 20. But under 20, exponential does have some significant differences from simple, so we go with that. Anyway, what this is telling me is on the two-minute chart, pound yen made a move down here. Okay, Now what has it done? It's come back to the 8 exponential. Now, if it can push through the 8 exponential and get a close on this next bar, it's basically saying, okay, this move is now done. So we've got to wait another minute and 18 seconds before we find that out. If it's not done, it has the potential to continue on further to push the Bollingers even further down. That's how we're using it. Okay. All right. Max says, Haha, Steve, I feel like that red hat fairy tale. Holly, what big ears you have. <laughs> okay. Uh, anyway, continuing to watch this one. And it looks like you know, another 30 seconds, and we'll know for sure whether that move is going to do continuation or not. <clears throat> in any case, we will. There's. Uh, we'll we'll build that that uh, bias chart in the next half hour. As far as news overnight, okay. The inauguration is done. We kind of got that out of the way. Dollar index basically weakened. You remember last week. 
Trump made the statement that he'd like to see the dollar a little bit weaker. He said it's too strong right now. Now some people interpreted that, you know, from a longer term standpoint, saying, Oh, he doesn't really want a strong dollar for his administration. And other people, especially during some of these confirmation hearings, uh, said, No, 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 he just meant in the short term that he felt the dollar was too strong. In other words, it had gone too far too fast since the election. And if we were to plot that on a chart, taking a look at UUP, since I don't have access to a dollar index on here, because MB Trading longer uh, allows access to the feed of the ICE exchange, the Intercontinental Exchange, where you can get the dollar index. So we just have to go with the UUP. Taking a look at a daily chart. Taking a look at the election, okay. Once the election was over, you can see the dollar started taking on a pretty strong stance. Okay. And in a consolidation mode, but eventually worked its way higher. Now, if you take a look at a true dollar index, you'd see that this got close to 103, 103 on a dollar index chart for the futures. That's kind of at this high point right here and then has since come down just a bit. Currently, tonight on the dollar index chart, we are, and I have to go to the other computer to look at this, where I have my thinkorswim. And overnight, since Friday, we reached a high of 101, let's just call it 101.50, so about a point and a half from these highs. Okay. And we then fell uh, through the rest of Friday afternoon, night Sunday, and then into Monday here. We're currently sitting at a price of 138. Okay, so another point below highs that we had achieved on Friday. Most people are looking to see if we can't break below parity on the dollar index, in other words, to get below 100. I haven't quite done that yet, this entire uh, down move, but we're getting pretty close. Getting pretty close. All right? Lows so far have been, let's see. That is not the right day. Take a look at this move here, and I'm also looking at last night's overnight lows. telling me that the overnight lows in the dollar index are even lower than this candle here, which was four days ago. So 100.17 is the new low. Oh, I understand why. I understand why. UUP hasn't opened yet. <laughs> when we have the opening of UUP today, we are likely to see a value below this candle right here new lows of the dollar index on the futures chart which is at 100.17 okay just so you know markets love to retest it's exactly what's happening with the dollar index testing the lows that we've had for the past month and looking for something that could go lower if possible all right dollar index of course overshadows everything it overshadows our all other currencies, it overshadows commodities, at least those that are denominated in dollars. Most of us know that there's a couple of commodities that are denominated in other currencies. Most often people look to copper, knowing that the bulk of copper trades on the London Metals Exchange, and so it takes its cue from the pound. All right, so... Uh, like again, okay, so news overnight. There was nothing there. You take a look at Forex Factory. 
hardly anything coming in. We had a, a German Bubba monthly report, so there's no actual numbers associated with that. Other than that, there is no European news. If you take a look at last night, yeah, nothing except for some Japanese news. So pretty quiet as far as news on the horizon. We just have to wait until tomorrow, and we see a whole slew of European, Euro, and pound news. Okay. However, keep in mind, it's in red. Draghi is speaking tonight over in Europe. Okay. Now, what's interesting is it's labeled 5.30 p.m. This is central time. This is my time zone. This will be 6.30 out. Okay. I don't know exactly where he's speaking because I'm pretty sure he wouldn't be speaking in Europe. You know, that would be midnight over there. Okay. So either he's at a conference somewhere around the world you know, and so this is being picked up. So I don't know if he's somewhere like, you know, in Singapore, maybe here in the States, not sure where, but he is speaking, and that will be done tonight. You'll probably see some volatility during Asian hours, which you usually don't see a lot of. Yeah, you don't see a lot of volatility in Asian hours. I get it tonight, depending on what he has to say. Don't know what the content or the topic of the speech is going to be, People will scrutinize that closely to see if he says anything about the current levels of stimulus that are being put out there for the euro. If he doesn't say anything about it, things might snap back. Okay. So it's been pretty quiet. Take a look at a few other things then, just to kind of get set up. Uh, since we know that the dollar is down overnight, in a continuation move of what happened during the uh, day leading into the inauguration and then the inauguration itself. Since absolutely nothing was said in Trump's inauguration speech about the economy, except for I American, and most people said, all right, there's, there's nothing new here to see. Let's just kind of continue on. And so since you had been seeing the dollar index going down, it continued to do so. When you take a look at gold, on a monthly chart is what I usually like to bring up, or a weekly chart so that you can kind of see the, the bigger picture. You can kind of see I, I'd drawn a, uh, a triangle on here. Once we broke through that triangle, uh, basically sending us downward, and this, of course, had to do you know, a little bit prior to the election is when we finally broke through that triangle. But uh, elect ever since the election has happened and, and the dollar got stronger, gold has been weaker. Well, you'll see then that about five to six weeks after the election, Basically in line with the fact that the dollars uh, had hit its highs and began to come back, you'll notice that gold has been rising. So gold and the dollar have pretty much been inversely uh, proportional in what they're doing. So as a result, gold's been making a nice comeback, but the best thing to do is to probably f put a Fibonacci on one of these lines and see, okay, just how far can we go before we run into some resistance. And so if I put this at the lows on that particular candle, you'll notice that we've retraced 38% okay, at 1207. I had been targeting a band or a range of, of 1307 to 1818 for resistance. And we really haven't broken through there. It touched 1320. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. <coughs> 1220. <laughs> 12.07 to 12.18 uh, was the levels that I was taking a look at. We broke through there to 12.20, and but really haven't maintained that level. We've kind of pulled back just a bit. So whatever happens to the dollar is directly going to affect gold, and that's kind of where we're at. So we're, we're hanging out, consolidating at the 38% retracement level. Okay. A lot of people are looking for a bigger retracement, possibly to the mid 1200s. 61.8 kind of puts us at you know 1255 or so, and get that. 
great, but that may be all she wrote. Okay, so we'll have to see. We'll have to see. It depends on how further, how much further the dollar is able to break down below the 100 parity level. Finally, crude. Crude likes to go through seasonal trends. And we're coming up on a seasonal trend in crude at the end of January, early part of February, in which we typically see crude rise into the late May or early June time frame, all having to do with the U.S. and, of course, other nations, too, having to build up supplies of gasoline for the summer driving season, the vacation season. Okay, They typically get that started in early February, start building stockpiles of that. So there's heavy demand by the refiners. That seasonal aspect pervades almost every year. You can see last year, right here, early February, made a rise. Didn't quite go to the early June time frame. This kind of hit, well, it was it was uh, right at the very, very beginning of June is where you've got this candle. So there's your seasonal aspect of crude. You typically see that almost every year. So if you go to some longer range charts and begin to plot those months, you'll see typically a rise during that time frame. We're expecting to do it once again. One of the things you need to keep in mind, though, is look at the level that we started last year. Look at the level that we're about ready to start this year. Okay? We are really going to be seeing higher prices as we go through that part of the chart, the seasonals. It says that here in the U.S., we'll probably be doing... $3 and higher gasoline for the summer driving season. Of course, some people are already at $3. California coast is. So they'll probably be even higher. Right? Anyway, OPEC did somewhat of a masterful job in finally saying, okay, we need to do some cutbacks. We need to get you know prices higher than where they were. And they've successfully been able to, you saw, our shoulder season as we went through the summer months, and we typically would see, you know, in the fall, prices down here. In other words, whatever we did here, we would reverse and get this down here. We weren't able to do that. That was all because of the talk of OPEC saying, well, we think we can do some cuts. So they got it. So this thing went into range-bound status. Now that's about ready to start the seasonals, starting from a much higher range than where we were last year, see higher prices. No, we'll probably be seeing 60 sometime in the next couple of months, especially by March. And then by the time summer driving season starts and before the refiners have imported all their requirements to make in the gasoline, we might even be seeing 70 in the April, May time frame. Now, it will give some back. We're expecting a more typical summer shoulder season and drop down like we typically would see. So that 70 will come off, and we may get back into the 50s somewhere along especially if U.S. producers are able to make up a major portion cuts that OPEC and Russia have gone through. You'll be able to see that. So it all depends on rig count here in the U.S. every Friday. And, of course, last Friday we had a pretty big rig count jump by 29 rigs. Okay. We are, are still not quite at peak we were a couple years ago, but we have reclaimed a lot of those rigs. Now, just because you know they're back in there doesn't mean that we've completely been able to wipe out all the OPEC cuts. Okay, there's about 1.8 million 
gal or barrels, 1.8 million barrels of petroleum a day at OPEC and Russia have been able to say that they're cutting. And with the rig count here in the U.S., they have the potential to make up 2 million of those barrels. So write that out. But it does take a while. I mean, just because you say, okay, we've got, we've, we've got this rig back up and running, it's not completed. Okay, the rigs are back in, but they still have to complete the rest of the infrastructure to get that stuff flowing. That takes a little bit of time. So there's going to be a little bit of a lag effect, you know, typically six, seven months before you kind of see that happening. So we'll see just how much the U.S. is able to, to cut into what OPEC has. All right, let me take a couple more questions here. Then we'll probably take a short break and come back and start building the uh, bias chart. So let's see. Jess, uh, sorry I didn't understand your analysis on GJ. Can you quickly recap for me? Thanks. Uh, oh, pound yen? Okay. Yeah, we were looking at the pound yen on a very, very short term chart. Okay. Two minutes. Right? What we were looking at was this move, okay? Notice how the Bollingers went into a squeeze. Oh, let's erase a bunch of this other stuff that we've got on the charts. Okay, now start over. That's how we were looking at the squeeze in the Bollingers. The, the blue is the Bollinger bands. They got close together right here. After a squeeze, you typically see some movement. So this thing was pushing the Bollingers down. Okay. So we like to see, you know, as quickly as we can trade that move. So when you see that the Bollingers are starting to expand, which you kind of see right here and here. Notice how the Bollingers are, are widening apart. Okay, that's a momentum move. We like to trade the momentum. Well, on a two-minute chart, which this only lasted about, you know, 15, I don't know, maybe 20 minutes at most. Okay, but there was a pickup of about 25 pips. It's in about 20 minutes. It's not too bad. Okay. So we typically will trade those moves. All right. Now, what I'm looking for is, is that downward? So I typically throw an 8 exponential moving average onto the chart. Okay. If we can get up there and actually close above there, notice that this one closed above there, this one closed above there, pretty much saying this downward move is over. Okay. Now it didn't reverse. Now you can see we're basically consolidating in a range once again, okay. tight range, and what's it, with the effect of that? It's bringing the Bollingers back down into a squeeze. Okay. So you're going to see these Bollingers come back down this into a squeeze eventually, and we'll start the whole thing over again. Now this one is just a two-minute chart. Some of us don't like to trade two-minute charts. So if you want to do this on a five-minute chart, a 15-minute chart, go ahead. It's your preference. Okay. That's all we're doing is looking for places where momentum is starting to increase in a trending direction, not chopping around like you have in this area right here, but an actual move. That's what we're looking for. And the Bollingers help to spot that. Okay. Typically, I like to do this daily chart time frame. Okay. Because what does it do? It allows me to see moves that are going to last for several days. And you can see that we had about 10 intervals here on a two-minute chart. Okay. You get one of those happening on a daily chart, and you go, whoo, some money here. <laughs> you will see that on a daily chart of the pound yen. And I'll show you that. Okay. Here's the same stuff. Bollinger's looking for a squeeze. Okay, looking for a breakout of that squeeze. I would say right in this area, I was able to achieve that breakout of a squeeze. Okay. Notice this was even prior to the election, folks. 
we started making that move prior to the election. Okay. Look how long it lasted. About six weeks. Okay. In that time frame, let's say you didn't catch the beginning of the move. Let's say you caught it right around here. 130 and a half. Okay. Hitting highs, 148, not quite a half. Okay. Well, that's at least 17 full uh, handles from 130 to 148. Okay. You're looking at about, if I compute this right, you're looking at about $17,000. All right. Space of five weeks. That's why I like to catch these on a daily chart. Now, you're not going to catch these all the time on daily charts. Notice this nice move happened over a period of five weeks. So once this thing gets going, you know, you're not going to see it again uh, for a number of weeks. But since, you know, there's typically most of us see about 24 currency pairs that we have access to. There's at least one of those happening all the time. Okay, just recently, Pound Canadian had a very nice move to the downside. Okay, caught one of those. All right, and it went for a couple of weeks in here. Okay, it's now rebounding. Okay, but that was a pretty nice catch that I was able to. to uh, find and I actually talked about it in the chat room a number of weeks back saying I'm catching this thing and I got in at 164.95 somewhere right in this area right after the squeeze when price contacted the black exponential it's about where I got in okay I'd be off by one maybe I, maybe it was 163.95 yeah, I think it was in this area, 163.95. I was able to catch this move. Okay. So, anyway, uh, one of these is happening all the time. Now, when you then look at it, you're looking at the relationship between price, which is candlestick, the black line, which is the 8 exponential, and 50, which is the green line. The green line gives you your bias. If you're trading above it, you're looking for bullish trades. So you're looking for pullbacks so that you can get long. If price is trading below it, you're looking to get short. You're looking for pullbacks in which to get short. Pullbacks to where? Well, pullbacks of price back to the exponential. So when I was here, okay, if I said, oh, I missed that move right there. Oh, doggone it. Well, you, you get another chance. See that? how green said, oh, here's a pullback. And then on the next day, you were touching that black line. That's your entry. You get short, and then you're able to enjoy it for another few days. Okay? When it comes back, when price comes back and contacts that black line, you have a choice to make. Either get out of the trade because it might be over, down, the trending move might be over, <clears throat> or well, definitely, if you've, or if you're not in the trade already, look for a cross of the black line and a close in the opposite direction. If you get that, that's saying, oh, possibly start trading this in the opposite direction now, and look at the move that you've had. Now, this was almost putting you in no man's land. Why? Because your bias was still short. Price is below the 50. But you had this nice trending move above the 8. So if you're an aggressive trader, you're not going to wait for the bias to change. Okay. If you're a more conservative trader and like to see these things line up, waiting for price to finally break above the 50 before you make that trade. Or choice. Okay. I'm just showing you method. This is just one method of trading. Tons of methods you can use. You can use intraday time frames. You can use moving averages. If you ever watch Chris Asaro, you know he's using a, a, a 
20, 10 period and a 20 period and other things for moving averages, okay? Uh, if you watch, uh, you know, Blake, he's, he's into a lot with fibs and stuff like that, so you know that's another method. If you've seen some of what I do, I often add Ichimoku into the mix. Okay, so you'll see a chart that looks like that with cloud added to it to give extra confirmation on your bias. Okay, all kinds of ways to trade. Okay. All right. Hopefully that helps in answering that question, Jess. Hasselhoff, good morning. Yes, I do sound different today because it's not Polly. <clears throat> yeah, you almost sound like Steven. Yeah, that's true. All right. Morning, Kevinton. Uh, Arun asks, do you think the oil countries will actually cut anything give they, if they need every cent? Well, they already have. Okay. In fact, this weekend, this weekend they went through an exercise in which they had uh, the the countries that were appointed to be watching for people obeying the cuts. They went through that and they said, "Yeah, they're doing it." I mean, you can actually see uh, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and a couple of others actually give uh, traders access. A lot of numbers. They can actually see, you know, what's going on at the port, stuff like that, so that you know whether the cuts are actually coming. And they know that Saudi Arabia has cut, and a couple others. Uh, I don't know if you can actually see that from the Russians, but since there is a cut that's happening, okay, we we know that at least some of that is happening. Okay. Granny says, Steve, we just logged in and great to hear your voice. Ah, thank you, Granny. Appreciate it. Jess says, okay, I thought you were looking at larger time frame. Cheers. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I probably missed the part where, where I first showed that chart as a two chart. So you're looking further down after the Bollinger Band squeeze. In, in that instance, we were. So we were at a pound. Let's just bring the pound yen back. and put it back on the daily or the two minute excuse me okay so this is the chart we were looking at okay now if price can break back below and maintain below the eight and it is right now okay it could be starting a new move now notice the Bollinger's I said they were going to come back into squeeze territory they did not quite as squeezed together as this area was this was a tighter squeeze and it was in a squeeze a little bit longer than what you have here but this is already showing you hey I'm starting a new move to the downside you could get short on the pound yen right now okay so hopefully you can see that squeezed right in this area didn't last as long as this one. Now the Bollingers are already starting to expand just a bit, starting to make a new move. Okay, as long as price stays below the black line and stay in that move. Okay. Now where do you place your stops? I typically place them. I call them U's. Okay, but you can see there's a little U here. A little U here, another U here, another U here. Now the U's are going to be the lows and the highs of a certain section of the chart. Okay, so you're looking for an area where, if you look to the left and look to the right, there's nothing equivalent to it. This little U here doesn't count because you got one, two, three, four. And already seeing a higher high than right here. Give yourself at least 13 intervals, 13 candlesticks. So say, oh, okay, here's a good U. Okay, here's a good U because 13 
candlesticks to the left, 13 to the right, I don't have anything equivalent to it. Those are the places where I like to put my stops. Okay? Now, in the context of that, you say, well, what about right here? If you're starting a new move, I'm not going to put my stop all the way up here. And I agree, you wouldn't, okay? So I would look at this area right here and say, it's the area at which I'm going to place my stop. Even though if I counted to the left, I, I run into this right here. On a new trade like that, I'm still going to put it fairly close. I like to keep tight stops. Why? Because as Kip has always preached, there are five things that can happen. Lose big or win big. That's two of them. Lose a little or win a little. That's up to four. The fifth one is break even. Okay? If I keep tight stops, I eliminate lose big. So what's left? Okay, well, I have two that offset. Lose a little, make a little. Break even is the third. What's left? In big. Oh, do you think out of 100 trades, you know, that even if three of them, 75% of the time, I either lose a little, make a little, or break even, that 25% uh, of those trades then, I make a lot. And out of 100 trades, I can finally make show a profit in my Forex account? You bet. As long as I've got stops in place, that only show lose a little. So that's why I'll initiate this thing here. If I was going to get short, initiating it here, even though I don't have 13 intervals to the left. I only want to lose a little. Okay. Anyways, that's how the Bollinger's already doing this. So you can see this pretty quick on a two-minute chart. Yeah, you can see these things happen pretty quick. It's fine. What's great is when you get this happening on a on a daily chart, and so you know that you got a lot more room to travel and being able to make money and stuff like that. So that's that's the nice thing. Anyways, we are still below the eight. So you can still be in this trade, okay? And but what you probably want to do is now that you've made some movement here, okay? Let's say you entered the trade. Let's erase some stuff. Say so you entered the trade right here. Is this thing made its move? You initially had your stop right up here. Right now, I'd have my stop back at break even. Now I would be moving my stop down to the break-even level so that the most I can lose is break-even, okay? Now watch this thing. On a two-minute chart, okay, as this thing continues to do its stuff, there's a little U that's forming right here. If you want to lock that in, you certainly can. Bring your stop from break-even down to the top of that green candle. Just progressively keep doing that until this thing you know, makes a move where it breaks through the black line and the trade is over. So right now, by moving that stop, you're at the point of IB says, what are the Bollinger Band settings, please? Two standard deviations, 20 period. Jess says, but how do you determine the direction? Can you see that that's going down? That's how you determine the direction. Visual. Jess says, oh, okay, I see. How do you, how you do it? To, okay, I see how you do it. Thanks so much. Okay, you're you're certainly welcome, Jess. Okay, I agree with your analysis, but I can't tell direction. Squeeze. Yep. Wait for the move. See, here's the squeeze. And wait for it to come out. Okay. Now there are some people who will look at this area. 
say, hey, look, I'm going to squeeze. Okay, but they won't wait for the Bollingers to do this. These are the aggressive traders, and let me outline what they're doing. They can see that there's a range. Okay, just trace a line through the tops and bottoms of these candlesticks. Okay, like that. A lot of them will do this. You see a candle break it, so they're looking at this one right here. Okay, they're saying that's where I'm getting short. As soon as I break that range on that candle, I'm getting short. Bollinger's at that point have not expanded just yet. It didn't happen till the next candle, and it, of course it, it made on the next candle till it pushed it down here. Okay, that's when the Bollinger's expanded. But if you see a range like that and want to get in ahead of time, again, choice. How conservative or aggressive do you want to be? If you want to wait for confirmation on something like this, you can. If you don't want to get in early, you can. You'll have more false breakdowns, breakouts in the, in the other direction. You'll have more false ones using that. But over time, again, over 100 trades, you're going to make a little bit more on that breakdown, early breakdown from the range rather than waiting for the Bollingers to expand. Okay, This is what we like to call Darvis box trading where you draw a, a box around the range and you wait for a breakout. Okay, That's a little bit different from what Blake has always taught us to wait for a pullback. Okay. All right, so let me see. Okay, the moving averages are 8 exponential. That's black. Green one is 50 simple. Oh, he's okay. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of you are probably tuning in late. Oh, he doesn't have a modem today. It got blown out in an electrical storm yesterday in San Antonio, where he's located. <laughs> so <laughs> he says, can anybody fill in, or do I just have to put an announcement out? I says, I can fill in. <laughs> so that's why I'm here today, okay? Bollinger Band settings are two standard deviations in 20 periods. Thank you, Jess. He says, great analysis and explanation was clear. Thank you. John. John says, Steve, so you enter the trade when price closes below the 8. Yeah, typically. Yeah, let's, let's go back. Oh, my cursor's messed up. Shoot, I'm late for taking a break, guys. A lot of questions here, so. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> You're entering, okay, let, let's say we're taking a look at this area right here, okay. You're entering price, kind of like when the train is leaving the station from the black line, okay. Let's say the black line is the train station, all right. So you see this one co contacting here, and you see range break right in there, okay, on that gray line, range break. What happened? You saw headline come back just a little bit so that it touched. But as it's leaving that station, you can get short. Okay. Now, if you want to wait for a close below there and then open it on the next candle, you can. Okay. Here's that same candle we were looking at. See where it closed. It closed below the black line. So, on the open of the next candle, if you want to open the trade there, you can. Okay. It's really, you know, this black line is like your entry. Okay. Now, a lot of people will say, oh, okay, if this was a daily chart, 
this happened to be a daily chart, people would say, well, that's, that's too much fudge room, you know, on a daily chart. And that's fine. Once you see it on the daily chart, Go to your intraday chart, you know, a 15 minute, a 10 minute, a 5 minute, even a 2 if you like. But go something inside of a day and look for the same pattern. Now, if you have something different, in other words, if your daily chart is showing bias to the upside and your intraday chart, like this 2 minute, is showing bias to the downside, what are you going to do? No trade. You want whatever you're going to enter your smaller time frame chart, where you're ever going to enter, you want it to agree with your daily. Okay? Daily takes precedence for bias. So, if the pound yen on a daily chart was actually showing bias to the upside, you're not going to take any short trades. You're going to wait until you see this type of formation in which uh, the candles are above the 8 and that's going to be your entry. Okay, so you're going to take these kinds of moves, not these. Because you want them to be in agreement. You want to trade with the trend, and the daily is your trend. Now, if you've never traded a daily because you only do quick in and out intraday scalps, then that's fine. Use something that can give you a bias, either a two-hour chart or a one-hour chart, okay, but trade in the same direction on your smaller time frame chart as what your bias chart is telling you, your setup chart, which is you know an hourly, a two-hour. Some of you use four hours. It's fine. Okay. Catherine says, thanks for still filling in. It's always a treat to have you. Thank you, Catherine. Appreciate it. Ken says, uh, Steve, did Kip ever post your recent taped Pippin strategy? I don't believe he did. Not sure what the holdup might be. Check the downloads. Oh, he's still only gone through November 11th. So that's one of them one of the Pippin broadcasts, but there's like two or three others. So, uh, so you know, you guys, when he comes on, uh, chat with him and, and find out. Um, I don't know that, I don't think that it's a technical glitch that they didn't come out. Okay? I think it's just that he hasn't gotten around to it. It's a big transition uh, with, with Blake being gone. And stuff, Kip's had to take on a lot more responsibility, and he's still doing stuff at the insurance agency. So, you know, he's he's been pretty busy. You want to send him a note, send him something when he's, you know, in the chat box when he's on webinar, you can certainly do that, Ken. Okay? All right. All right, I apologize to those who are coming in late thinking that Holly would be right in the middle of building that bias chart, and we haven't done it yet. So uh, let's go ahead and take a short break and then come back and build that. Okay.